Some of you may know her from the church's multi-generational book clubs, or as a nice woman who's always there to give someone a ride. I had the honor of sitting down with June and learning about what made her the lovely woman we know today. June was born in 1926, in the midst of the Great Depression. Growing up in St. Louis, June was a good student, grading 13th in her class. June went to college for four and a half years to become a teacher and taught grade school children from kindergarten through eighth grade. After being retired, June participated in reading buddies at Longfellow and finally participates in an after-school knitting class at Whittier and volunteers at the economy shop. June's husband, Donald, originally studied to be an engineer, but participated in many career paths, such as being in the ministry, a car salesman, a psychiatric counselor for prisoners, and an engineering professor. June moved to Oak Park in 1994 to help take care of her husband after he had a severe stroke. Throughout June's life, even though she faced many hardships with her family and her personal life, she still tries to help as many people as she can and works with, to help others. June learned about Pilgrim through her realtor and was introduced by Evelyn. June and Evelyn quickly became friends through Book Club, The Economy, and The Economy Shop. And June gave Evelyn rise to church. June is always kind to others and helps other members of our community and hopes that others will help her when she needs it. June is a remarkable woman and I was very lucky to learn about her life. And I can confidently say that me and the members of Pilgrim will always be there to help June when she needs it. Thank you. Grace was born in Chicago on December 26, 1928. She grew up in a nice neighborhood west of Austin. Her first job in grade school was when she worked as a babysitter for 35 cents an hour. When she was a teenager, she also worked at the bakery on North Avenue. It was during this time when she met Evelyn in her freshman in their freshman year Latin class. They're still friends now, so it must have been a match made in heaven. While in high school, they were part of a group of eleven friends and called themselves Crew. This group stayed together all through their high school and into their adult lives, meeting up every so often to catch up. Grace grew up during the Great Depression, a very hard time for our country, but has said that she never felt like they were poor though it has affected the way she views money in her adult life. For example, it is the reason why, why she'll drive to different stores to find the cheapest price for milk. <laughs> <laughs> After high school, Grace attended a few, a few years of college and then worked at a packaging company. A fond memory of, that Grace shared with me was in 1954, when she and Evelyn saved up enough money to travel to Europe for six months. I asked her what she thought was the biggest difference between 2019 and when she was growing up. Grace explained that everything is so fast these days, especially with the internet at our fingertips, and it was much simpler back then. Grace was led to Pilgrim when Evelyn's daughter was searching for a church to get married in. Pilgrim must have made a good impression because she's still here after all these years. One of Grace's passions is her work with cluster tutoring. She has been with the program since it began in 1990. She has worked as a member of the Cluster Board of Directors, where she assisted with fundraisers and volunteered as a tutor. She also would help out when it was Cluster's Donut Day. As we commemorate National Women's Month, I can think no one better than Grace to set an example for women my age. Her dedication to her, to her friendships, family, community, and congregation is truly amazing. Thank you. run for their money. Beyonce, AOC, and many others are great, marvelous people that are killing it in the year of 2019. But did you guys know that Evelyn has been working just as hard as those guys but for almost 90 years? <laughs> Born April 25th, 1929, Evelyn has always been a hard worker and passionate woman. She used to help her father rewire the house at a young age. She was constantly working and got her first job in an ice cream parlor called Prince Castle at 14. You, want, you guys want to know what I was doing at 14? Definitely not working, because guess what? 14 year olds can't work in this day and age. Crazy. <laughs> Evelyn has always been a bit of a rebel and kept a sharp tongue. Well, good student and active and learning, Evelyn had also had a bit of a rebellious streak. In 
high school, her teacher caught her chewing gum in class and asked her what she was doing. She replied bluntly, chewing. That got her sent to the principal's office and they called her mother. Truly a rebellious teenager. <laughs> but letting me know that Evelyn's spirit could never be crushed, she constantly was working to provide for herself and her husband, whom she had met while, she, while working in an advertising firm. They lived in New York City for some time, and her husband ended up losing his job. That made her the sole provider for, of her family, which was difficult to stay, considering the low amount of pay and regard for women workers back in the day. Evelyn was convinced that her husband was trying to help out by getting another job. It turned out that he had never showed up to any job interviews. For seven years, Evelyn worked her butt off while her husband did absolutely nothing to help. <laughs> in fact, she even got pregnant while she was working and still had to work. There was no maternity leave back then, so Evelyn would lose her job and never get it back if she had a kid. Eventually, she was fed up with her husband's behavior and moved out, taking her daughter with her. Taking initiative like that was brave and mild and one of the most extraordinary things about Evelyn. Even to this day, I see her hardworking and resilient spirit that I aspire to have myself. She has worked hard and long to hold her own and provide for her family in such troubling times that were obstacles to a woman working and solely providing for her family. While she is now retired, she still actively participates and contributes to our church community and is a delight to be around. We are honored to have such a lovely, free-spirited woman in our midst. Thank you, Evelyn, for contributing continue to inspire us all with your achievements. And so today it was very important that we affirm you as members of this faith family and your part in the shaping of this world. So thank you. So the European Enlightenment says, has a certain um, philosophical construct that says, I think, therefore I am. But scripture really embraces a more African construct of community that says, I am because we are. 
Because it's not just what we think of ourselves, but how the community holds each of us. And that really is the great I am. So thank you to this community for being a place of affirmation and welcome. And this, this trying to be in community is challenging. In fact, it's amazing that the Christian church has survived all these centuries. Because as we gather, all of us trying desperately to figure out a way for all of us to get along. For each of us has a function in the body of Christ, each with a different role or gift, all of us trying to find a place and not trying to knock each other over in the process. Because you know what? Being in community is really hard work. I mean, some of us are Democrats and some of us are Republicans and some of us don't vote at all. Some want to return to a place they remember as a simpler time when, when people knew their place. And some will fight to the death never to return to that mindset. Even with all that, here we are in church. You like the songs you grew up with, and someone else likes more contemporary renditions. And then we are asked to serve in ministry and on committees. You never let me finish a sentence. And you know what, I just need time to process. And what are we talking about? <laughs> and we love to eat. I mean, the very idea of Christian unity is the common table. Everyone's sitting around a common table sharing this great, amazing thing we call grace, but shouting, pass the potatoes, and no, don't put ketchup on that, and hey, I'm gluten-free, and that better be sugar-free. Vegan, please. And where is the hot sauce? Your council member just took the last dinner roll, and do I really have to eat one more cheesy casserole? But somehow we come together and we all eat each other's food, and the food and the conversation and the fellowship somehow never runs out. And then for some reason we still all come to worship on Sunday mornings and continue to attempt to make our lives more reflective and to find the God spirit with us and within us. Even with all that going on, God is still present. I think if you just look around the sanctuary, and some of you know the stories present here, you can't help but know there is a God. And whatever image you may impose on that God, or whatever language you use for God, know this. I don't believe that we are just here for our own sakes. I really believe we are here because we are meant to love one another. Bishop Desmond Tutu said, we were born for goodness. We don't have to try to understand the mind of God. We only have to acknowledge that God is at work in each of us, in you, and you, and you. And that there is, no matter how you feel about the people you are sitting next to, a call and responsibility to stay in community and in unity with one another is here. Perhaps that's why the United Church of Christ is called to be a united and uniting church. Our motto is that they may all be one. In essentials unity, in non-essentials diversity, in all things charity. So today I want us to explore together the spirit of community. Today Paul speaks to us as a reminder to each of us who endeavors to continue the good fight. Our text today is a reminder to each of us who endeavors to do good of the pitfalls 
that await us in our work. The work of following Christ, the work of staying in community, and there are pitfalls. Especially in times of transition, of staying in the work of establishing community. It's hard deciding who will be the leaders among us. It's hard working towards consensus when you know what everybody should do. But others don't see it quite the way you do. The pitfalls are being discouraged. The pitfalls are selling out, giving up, making it all about you. But today's scripture provides a remedy for those hazards. The message translation of Philippians reads, if spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other, love each other, be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front, don't sweet talk your way to the top, Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. This text reminds each of us what is required of those who decide to build together to be a church community together, to speak truth to power, to remove the rocks of indifference. This text informs us what a life led by the Spirit should look like, being a deep friend, showing love, helping others to get ahead. Paul encourages us to have the same mind as Christ Jesus, be tender. It's important to remember because hurt people hurt people. Show compassion because we seldom know what someone else really is going through. Don't be selfish. Let somebody else shine. Speak in love because your words do matter. Your words can minister. And look for the spark of God in others. Internalize the words of that old gospel song, if I can help somebody, then my living won't be in vain. We, like others who live before us, live in lean times. We, like others who live before us, live under a cloud of fear and uncertainty. Yet we are called to service within a faithful community. So today I urge each of us to commit to build upon the labors of those who have gone before us and to work to construct every day a new reality. Let each of us decide to follow the example of Christ. Decide, and it is a decision to love your neighbor, even, yes, when they get on your nerves. Decide to work for justice. And decide to see the power and the purpose of those people we think are just so very ordinary. Why? Because it is our duty it is our duty, and this is how we make a difference in the world, because we are the hands, the feet, and the heart of God. There is so much building and healing to do. Families need mending, communities need nurturing, politicians need to be held accountable, places of safety need to be created. Places of restoration need to be crafted, and places of honor need to be expanded. And people of God, it is up to us. It is up to 
the faithful to decide to come together to fight the good fight, to build a new reality, to do a new thing. Scripture says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. <clears throat> Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. This we can do with God's help. <clears throat> so we can turn this battle-worn, corrupt world around. Amen. Yeah.